we're just going to give it a couple of minutes while people start to join us. Hello everyone and a really warm welcome to this evening's Green Build session, the story of Wild Ken Hill. This evening's session is being held as part of Green Build, a two week event which North Norfolk District Council are hosting to run in tandem with the United Nations Climate Change Conference currently being held in Glasgow, COP26. The online Green Build event this year has set out to explore a wide range of climate change and environmental topics with the hope of provoking a greater awareness of the issues that we all face, but also to hopefully inch that little bit closer to the answers to a sustainable, brighter and greener future for us all. My name is Annie Samazi and I'm the Climate Change and Environmental Policy Manager at North Norfolk District Council and I will be hosting the event this evening. My colleague Nige will be on hand today to help with any digital aspects of hosting, such as um, assisting with the chat bar and live polls, which I will come on to in a minute. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we are recording this event primarily for those people who couldn't attend this evening's session. Um, so you are all aware throughout the whole of the evening, your cameras and microphones will be automatically muted and turned off. Um, despite this, there will be opportunities for you to interact with us um, and we'll let you know how and when you can do this. Um, so just to check that you can hear me, um, we're going to pop a couple of questions up onto your screen now, which you can answer. Please don't worry, uh, your answers are going to be anonymous, so do feel free to be as honest as you want to be. So the first question, um, what is the weather like where you are? So wild and windy, clear and chilly, no idea, it's dark outside and none of the above. Okay, so we can pop the results for that up, uh, which looks like most people don't know because it's dark. We know that it's wild and windy because we went for a walk about half an hour ago and got absolutely soaked here in Cromer. Um, so next question. Have you ever visited Wild Ken Hill or a similar project elsewhere? Um, so yes, I have. No, but I would like to. Um, no, not sure. Um, I fully understand rewilding. Okay, and the answers are all coming in. And should we publish the results of that one? Okay, so 71% of people here haven't visited, um, but would like to. Um, and uh, we've got 5% uh, of people who are not sure they fully understand rewilding. So Dom, hopefully by the end of this, um, you'll have answered um, all of the questions that people will have. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, Later on today, um, you will have the opportunity to submit questions to um, today's presenters, Dominic. Um, you can do this by typing questions into the Q&A bar situated at the bottom of the screen on the control panel. You may send your questions in at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these address and then address as many of them as possible during the Q&A session. Um, we will not be able to answer these questions um, in, until that session actually commences. 
Um, if you do wish to use the chat bar at all, then you can do this. The chat bar can be viewed by everyone. So we do please ask that you are respectful in your comments and mindful that, of course, Green Build is a family friendly event. Uh, my colleague Nigel will also be on hand to field any quick clarifications and comments. So please feel free to use this function should you wish to. To check that the chat bar is working, and if you want to, you can now type your name in and where you are dialing in from. Okay, so we've got people coming in from Norwich, Sheringham, Bangor, good effort, Cambridge, um, Bakenham, London, Cambridgeshire, Norwich. Okay, it looks like we've got people from all, all over the place, which is brilliant. Great. Um, so you're aware um, all of the instructions for today's session are also going to be posted in the chat bar so that you can refer back to them if you wish to. And my colleague Nigel is just going to do that. Um, if I or anyone else have any IT issues um, this evening or connection issues, then please don't panic. Um, we will try and resolve these as quickly and as smoothly as possible, but please do bear with us. And if things are really catastrophic, um, we can always reschedule the event if it's absolutely necessary. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over this evening to Dominic. Um, Dominic is the founder of Wild Ken Hill Project, which he currently manages alongside the estate director, Nick Padwick. As well as founding the overall project at Wild Ken Hill, um, Dom also leads on collaborations with other organisations and is keen to share his knowledge of the approach that's been adopted at Ken Hill. So, Dom, over to you. Thank you very, very much, Annie. Um, and thank you to everyone. Um, uh, on the Green Build team for having me tonight. And to those of you who have all um, who registered and, and come along this evening to, to learn a little bit about what we do, um, I'm genuinely extremely grateful because uh, engagement is a really big part of what we do at Wild Ken Hill. Um, you know, we've, we've got cracking with what we think is quite an interesting project, but actually the, the impact from that um, comes when we when we engage with those around us about it uh, and, and spread some of the ideas that, that are in place on our own site. Um, so I'm, I'm genuinely really grateful. Thank you for coming. I hope we have a really good session tonight. I suppose it's especially important, um, you know, running in parallel with COP26 and the great weight of expectation that we have put on, on those events to try and deliver a better and greener future for ourselves. Um, and I thought I would start by saying that you know, while, while a lot of those, those, those sort of external exogenous factors can feel, um, you know, quite distressing sometimes, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person uh, on, on this uh, webinar this evening that has, you know, serious concerns and even anxiety about the state of our environmental and ecological future. Um, it always, it always, I always remind myself that we can only control what's in our power to control, we control the controllables, um, and to focus on the things around us that are that are making progress um, and that, that are providing hope. And I hope that's something that I can help to do this evening. Let's going to share my screen. Bear with me one second. Right, here we are. So those of you who, who, who don't know exactly where Ken Hill is, and I saw there were some quite exciting locations on the, on the chat there. Uh, we're on the west coast of Norfolk. Um, so pointing back towards uh, you know, over the wash, back towards the rest of, of England and the UK. Um, a funny little spot, really, on the west coast there. Uh, we're about three hours north of Norfolk, uh, north of London, rather. Um, the wash immediately to our west, and then the north Norfolk coast, with, with all the fantastic biodiversity there, uh, not far from us, and indeed, um, you know, plenty of mixed, you know, native woodland, uh, semi-natural woodland to our south in Sandringham and all the way down to Thetford in a sort of corridor. So, Quite a lot of biodiversity around us, but also, we're, we're, you know, we're in Norfolk, we're in East Anglia, the breadbasket of the UK. And I suppose that's the, the context for the project which started here um, a few years ago. Prior to that, to the start of the Wild Ken Hill project, um, I suppose Ken Hill was managed in a pretty conventional way for a, for a Norfolk land holding. Um, you know, about 75 to 80% of the land uh, was it dedicated to agriculture. Um, maybe more, maybe a bit more than that, actually, maybe 80, 85%. Uh, and the rest really in, in, in woodlands, 
mostly mostly in one big block of woodland and other, other small ones dotted around. Um, and I suppose the the farming we were we were practicing before was although it was conventional, it was in the conventional paradigm. It was on the nature friendly side. So you know the biodiversity, for example, at Ken Hill was was pretty solid. Um, but I guess you know actually what we were really doing, and I suppose what's been happening for a long time now, is is a managed retreat of, of the biodiversity. So we 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 kind of we we that's that's the that's the situation we were in. It it felt like we we're in quite a quite a nice place for nature. But when you when you start to look at the statistics, um, as you know, in the UK and globally, we realise that that actually, you know, we we are we are really in the midst of the crisis. Um, I think you know there were two there was. That that was the context, I suppose, for the project, and and one of the one of the two motivations, I suppose, for starting the Wild Ken Hill project, which, which was in 2018. Um, the chart on the left I, I've put there is, is is from the State of Nature report, and is one of many you can you can select um, about the decline in biodiversity since uh, well you can pick any period really you know 50 years, 200 years it's it's been pretty downhill in the UK. Uh, no matter what, what timeline you look at. But for instance, in the last 50, 60 years, we've seen about 60% of our biodiversity, you know, lost. Um, if you look at the abundance of, of some priority species, and we knew, you know, we knew, um, pri you know, private land managers, I think, have the power and responsibility to do something about that. Um, you know, after all, you know, 70, 75% of the UK surface area is farmed. Um, and actually, a lot of that is is is, is privately owned, um, and it's so. It's, I think it's on responsibility lies with people like us to to try and reverse those those fortunes. Um, you know, looking looking to other environmental issues, there's the of course the, the massive interconnected issue of climate change, um, and we we knew with with natural climate solutions that that actually we wanted to do something about that too. Um, so a lot of where the Wild Ken Hill project came from. I suppose was a was a deep desire with with myself and my family and those who work on our team to to do much much more for the environment to become what we we hope we're becoming a, as a national exemplar for how you know land management private land management can deliver public goods things that society needs. Um, I'm also very open about the fact that the another part of the motivation for the the, the Wild Ken Hill project uh, was commercial. Um, in the sense that if we did nothing, um, you know, if we didn't change the way we were managing our farm, uh, we were probably going to start losing money um, with, with the change in policy setting precipitated by Brexit. Um, so for those of you not familiar with, with the impact that Brexit has had on, on the farming sector and it, it is having, um, previously we were governed under the, covenant, uh, the common agricultural policy uh, uh, as part of the EU. Um, and, and under that policy, uh, UK farmers, along with farmers across the continent, were able to receive um, reasonably significant subsidies um, in order to uh, boost production, really. So you, you, you would receive a, a, a subsidy um, per acre that you were farming. Um, so we were encouraged to farm as many acres as we could. Um, and that, that, that is now changing. Uh, it's being phased out because of Brexit and being replaced by a new scheme. Um, that the, the UK is designing, and we, we probably come back to that in the Q&A, which I think is, 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 is exciting and has the potential for great change. But the, commercially, the, the bottom line for that was that the subsidies we we're going to get from the EU were, were going to be phased out quite quickly. That's the chart on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, and this is, this is interesting because 42% um, of farms in the UK, the National Audit Office estimated, don't make money uh, without this subsidy. Uh, huge, huge numbers of farms don't make money without this subsidy. Um, and farming is very volatile. So, you know, Ken Hill was, was a farm that made money most years without the subsidy. Uh, but when the weather's bad, as it was last farm year in harvest 2020, uh, we, would, we would lose money. Uh, our business would not make money without the subsidy. So actually, we realised our business was probably not going to be sustainable post-Brexit either. Um, and so we actually needed to change. Um, and, and what we wanted to do, given our environmental passions, was to uh, to embed nature in our business and to actually use nature and natural processes uh, to deliver goods that, that we think uh, society, government and people, people really need. 
And what we came up with um, was I suppose this, this three prong approach to the way we manage our land. Um, each of those prongs is a different land management tool. I suppose it's a, it's a, a different way of, uh, of managing the areas based on, um, based on really, you know, their, their differing characteristics and in particular their soil types. Now, I suppose the, the one we've become most uh, aware of, uh, most well known for, I suppose, is, is the rewilding project. Um, that takes, that's the orange area in the center of this slide, which takes place in about 25% of Ken Hills, but about a thousand acres of the holding. Um, we've done that there because um, that was, that was, well, the, the fields I'm going to indicate with my cursor. Now these fields uh, and these down here were our worst in terms of farm productivity. There are porous soils, um, very, very sandy in parts, um, sand that blows away in the wind, doesn't hold nutrients or water very well. Um, we, were, we were seeing a lot of black grass and other quite persistent weeds build up in our soils and therefore applying a lot of chemicals um, to deliver a yield from those. Um, and so we were doing a lot of environmental damage just to create a, quite a get quite a poor amount of food out of that land. Um, this is what we would call marginal land. So farmland that's not particularly good and really we were probably only farming it in the first place because of, because of the common agricultural policy I mentioned before, because we were in the EU for so long, uh, which, which, which boosted, or which really incentivized us as farmers to farm poor quality land like this to boost overall production. And we felt actually, um, we can manage this land in a different way to deliver different goods um, that this country needs. So with the rewilding area there is all about now, it's about creating a, a, a new nature reserve. It's about um, you know, exploding biodiversity and storing carbon in the soil and above ground biomass. And that's why we are, we, we are rewilding in this area here. Now adjacent to that and slightly closer to the wash is an area of freshwater marsh, um, about Five, 500 acres here and a bit of coastal scrub, little finger here, about another 100 acres or so. Um, and that, of course, you know, being next to the rewilding area, well, why not? Why isn't that included? Um, and actually, that we are practicing there something else. We're practicing something I would call traditional conservation. Um, and that's the sort of conservation you would, you would find in uh, most nature reserves around the UK, uh, in your wildlife trust or RSPB reserves. It's, it's a very different approach to rewilding, but it's a complementary one. Um, rewilding is very passive. Uh, it's very non-interventionist. I'll come back to these, these ideas later. Um, you, you, the thinking is that you put in place natural processes uh, and those processes then deliver biodiversity outcomes for you, but you focus on the processes. Traditional conservation, in my view, is, is quite different. Um, firstly, it's extremely active. So, a lot of time, money and effort goes into uh, managing reserves in this way. Um, it's quite a granular, detailed approach. Uh, you know, you might go in and, you know, take out a bit of scrub here, expand a, a water course slightly there. Um, it's, it's much more active. It's much more human led. Um, and the other thing about traditional conservation is it's very outcome focused. Now, we think we think that's an appropriate way of managing land there um, because that area is quite quite open it's quite grassy and it has really good interest for wading birds for rare wading birds um you know things like lapwing and red shank and avocet and the rewilding approach there actually may have done damage to that ecosystem it's it's not stable enough on its uh, you know without human intervention it, it would it would have probably gone backwards in particular um if we'd have left if we'd rewilded it it probably would have seen a growth in the vegetation there and then probably also in the number of predators there uh, which have been bad news for our rare, rare wading birds. But instead, we're following a traditional conservation approach side by side with, with the rewilding area. Two different tools in the box, basically. Two different types of conservation, both equally necessary and important, I think, um, if, we are, if we are to make any difference to the, to the topics I mentioned earlier. Now, the third part of our approach, and the one I suppose we've become most excited about in, in the last year or so, is something called regenerative agriculture. Now we're doing this on um, our productive soils. As you go inland, the soil gets a bit better, a bit less sandy, a bit more chalky, um, a bit more productive. Um, and so, you know, we think that that sort of land needs to be needs to be farmed, right? We need to grow food from that, those areas. But 
we have to do it in a way that is sustainable, truly sustainable in the long term. It doesn't jeopardize uh, future generations. So um, we, we're practicing something called regenerative farming, which I'll come back to what that really means and looks like. But at, at a high level, it's about growing, growing lots of healthy food, uh, but side by side with restoring your soil health. It's about improving soil health. Um, and there are lots of exciting things that happen when you improve your soil health, um, including storing carbon in it. So another way of, 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 of mitigating climate change. So the three prongs come together. We think that's really cool because um, we think we're the only people doing those three things side by side. And we think if we scaled up this sort of, you know, approach, a three way approach across other parts of lowland England, we'd start to deliver the right mix of things that we need as a society um, to deal with these, to, you know, the, the dual challenges of growing, growing food, for a growing population whilst also reversing and mitigating climate change and the interconnected loss in biodiversity. I'm now going to sort of dive in a bit into each of those three prongs so to just to get under the skin of them a bit more. The first being, being the rewilding area where um, put this slide together really just to give you an idea of what it's what it's been like for the last two or three years managing something like this. You know, it's quite a new thing. Um, and we, what we start with is, is understanding the ecology of the site. So for us, we needed to understand things like the soil type and what residual fertility there might be there. We wanted to understand the hydrology of the site, how the water moved around. And that had then, uh, for example, really impacted the way we thought about the natural grazing regime that we wanted to put in. So I talked about natural process and I, I will some more. Um, the, the, the grazing animals you bring in, the, the pigs, the ponies, the cattle, um, they're key drivers of any rewilding project. They're really the site managers. They're the ones that make the change happen for you. As when you're a, you're a passive homo sapien sitting back in the office, the, 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 the cattle, the ponies and pigs, they're managing it for you. So understanding the ecology of the site allowed us then to really pick a natural grazing regime, which worked for us. It also informs the species reintroductions that you're going to, um, that you're going to uh, think about. So for us, you know, it was principally been beavers uh, because beavers are ecosystem engineers that, that help to transform landscapes and, and a key really in thinking about any rewilding process. Then there's a lot of other stuff that I suppose goes around the background. We, we took out a lot of internal fencing in order to allow the, the, the grazing animals to wander freely around the place. Uh, we've been engaging heavily with our local communities, uh, building lots of partnerships um, with, with organizations um, we've managed, we've also ended a lot of things. So a lot of, a lot of work we were doing in that rewilding area, we, we don't have to do it anymore. We don't, we don't trim hedges, uh, we don't do any commercial forestry. So actually, as a team, we've got back quite a lot more time from this approach. And the final thing has been um, research and monitoring, which, is, which I can't emphasize how important that is, is the, 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 the measurement of the success of this project is key in the, in, in, in the future for us allowing us to, to communicate the success or not of the project to different stakeholders. So we've, we've invested a lot in, in, in developing a baseline um, of, of the biodiversity on the site, uh, lots of photographs, lots of surveys and so forth, aerial mapping, um, really in, in, intense sort of, you know, ecological monitoring so that we can see where we are in 10 years and see what, see what the impact has been. So this is what it's this is what's starting to happen now. We're two springs in, two two growth cycles, I suppose, of the vegetation in the rewilding area, um, and what we're seeing, especially around the edges of our our fields, that they've all come out of arable farming. Okay, not dairy, but arable farming, is um, first first year we saw lots of volunteer crops, so just bits of wheat coming through here, bits of oilseed rape coming through there. In the second year we've seen a lot more scrubby vegetation develop. Um, and what's happening here is seed dispersal um, and maybe some existing root structures um, growing up around the edges of our fields. Uh, in the left here, we've got a bit of gray willow, I think in the right, some alder. Um, and elsewhere, we've seen lots of the hedgerow species. So, um, you know, hawthorn, blackthorn, dog rose, these sorts of things getting like starting to grow ankle and knee height, marching out from the hedgerows and woodlands into the field. And this is uh, hugely exciting because we've not planted any of this stuff. Um, this is all nat what we call natural regeneration, right? These are veget you know, species of tree and plant growing themselves, no assistance from us. Um, 
and it, you know scrub what, what was this what this scrubby species what we're seeing here is, is is exciting because that's a that's a habitat which we've which we've lost a lot of in the last 60 or 70 years uh, especially as we we push to increase agricultural area through the war world war ii and post-war um and it's and it's and, it's, and a habitat which uh you know iconic species like the turtle dove we you know heavily rely on scrub uh, and and you know species like that we've seen over a 90 percent decline in that period so scrub is great to see for us we're really excited about that um natural regeneration of these these native species now obviously if you as many will know if you if you leave that stuff to grow unchecked for 20 or 30 years or more you will eventually have um a closed canopy woodland right uh where it'll have just grown up into into forest no light coming through static habitat actually woodlands are lovely but when they're closed canopy like that and then they're not grazed associated with um actually you know quite average levels of biodiversity so this is where the natural grazing animals come in 20x more ponies on the left 45 head of red pole cattle on the right and their job is to basically enter into a, a lifelong battle with the natural regeneration of, of those species a tug of war um, that they're grazing and browsing it down constantly and when we get that balance right uh, that's when we start to see some ex exciting biodiversity outcomes so um, you know these guys bring natural processes you know which i talked about earlier as being key to the rewilding approach um, in spades you know they they're, they're grazing and browsing, but they're also, ex, you know, excreting uh, the whole time and cycling nutrients. They are encouraging seed dispersal. They carry it around in their fur. Um, they create soil disturbance with their, their hooves and the ponies when they take dust baths. So these are real drivers of landscape and ecological change for us. And they've done, a, I'd say they've done a really fantastic job in the first year or two, uh, changing the structure of the vegetation. So all that volunteer crops that we, all, all that stuff we've seen in the first year is basically gone and been replaced with what we're starting to see is quite an interesting and diverse sward um so it's really really excellent for the for the initial kind of biodiversity gains alongside them and the pigs and the pigs do something slightly different they do graze a little bit especially in the summer but they're, they're sort of omnivores and from this time of year right through till late spring you know what they're really doing is rootling um, it's a process of turning the soil over like this on the right here with their upturned snouts um, leaving bare soil disturbing it in the process and that's fantastic because um, when they do that it encourages any dormant seeds in the seed bank to germinate um, and so this, these guys are actually accelerating uh, one of the things they do is accelerate the pace of natural regeneration in the rewilding area um, but fascinating i've also seen you know, in, in, in the middle of winter when the ground is, is a bit hard, even when it was snowy, you know, pigs coming in, turning over soil, looking for, you know, worms and bulbs and roots um, and leaving the bare soil a bit warmer, insects kind of maybe disturbed. And then suddenly lots of birds coming in to feed, a bit like you see seagulls behind the plough. Um, and so that, you know, they're in a way providing little micro habitats the whole time with this rootling. Um, and so again, really key process. I tend to think about, the wild herbivores that we're missing from our landscape that you know maybe become extinct in the last you know five to ten thousand years um, and one of those that we don't have in norfolk at the moment is the wild boar and the pigs are really mimicking the behavior of the wild boar with their behavior the four tamworth pigs another key driver is, is, is the beaver and this was us reintroducing uh, two pairs last year in uh, march and october 2020 and the impact i'd say has been really, really exciting. So they've got 55 acres of enclosure um, to roam around in and do their work. Um, and it's actually changing, it's changing pretty at a pretty good pace, despite that large area they have to work in. So on the left here is one of a few dams that we've seen built now. And um, this one is actually in the last few weeks, I've seen them come back to this dam and build at a kind of layer. And the water level behind it is, is much, much higher now. Uh, and that's kind of the case throughout that, that enclosure. The water levels have just gone up quite a lot. The other thing, of course, they're doing is, is, is knocking over trees. So seem to have gone for a lot of young sycamore and also uh, white poplar like this they've gone for in, in particular. Um, and those are, just two, those are just two of the key things they do, the two, two key natural processes. One is raising water levels and, and the other is opening up the canopy and letting more light in. 
And what they're really doing is, is overall, therefore, is creating a bit more of a messy, wetter, wilder kind of area. The area they're actually in, and if you look at old maps, it's called the Fen. Uh, about 200 years ago, the Fen. So very open, wet landscape, drained and then planted upon in the last 200 years with trees. And so these, these beavers now are actually kind of reversing that process. And we call them ecosystem engineers because that, that, that wetter and wilder areas, um, they actually host a whole range of other species. So whether it's aquatic plants and aquatic invertebrates, um, you know, reptiles, amphibians, fish, otters and other mammals like water voles, um, you know, all and the birds and bats that, that feed on those, those inverts all actually uh, benefit from the habitats created by beavers. So again, I'm here tonight giving a webinar with you know, all the time that I've been given back, but, you know, not having time to farm this area and the beavers and, and the, the, the cows and ponies are out there managing the site for us, delivering benefits. And that's what's really exciting, I think, is, is the way we're working with nature to do this. So then next door, the, the, the area of traditional conservation, the freshwater marshes. Um, now in 2019, the winter of 2019, we embarked on quite a big project there to raise the water levels by about um, a foot. Uh, we, that's us up here. You, you can see we're not afraid to get involved when we need to. Plenty of, we had several diggers on site for three or four months. A lot of earth was moved. Um, and this on the right hand side, you can see this was, the, this was that winter immediately after we'd raised the water level. It was pretty dramatic. Uh, and we just had a bonanza, a huge increase in the, in the species use of that area. Um, subsequently now using the uh, sluices that we've put in place uh, to quite accurately measure, we'll finally, I suppose, tweak the, uh, the, the water levels um, as well as the grazing pressure uh, for target species. So, you know, earlier this year, um, it was a bit wet in May, we could see the water levels rising and rising um, and they were getting quite close to some of the lapwing nests that we'd seen. Uh, and so we just took one board out of the sluices um, just so those nests wouldn't, wouldn't get too wet. Um, so it's just an example of us being very involved and, 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 and actively managing the landscape. Um, exciting thing about that, this, uh, this, this spring, seen 67 avocet, seven red shank and 20 lapwing pairs on nests. So really, really good outcomes for us in, in year one uh, of, of or the second year rather of, of after this, the raising of the water levels. And our challenge now is just to get better at managing the site with those high water levels. Um, I should say both this project and the rewilding area and, and actually a lot of, a lot of uh, the options in our regenerative farming system have all been delivered in a really close partnership with Natural England um, who are really fantastic advisors to us and, and I should definitely make known that none of this could have happened without them. So thanks to those guys. The third part of our approach then is, is the regenerative farming. And I won't bang on too much about the definition because it does get a bit technical and, and, and maybe academic, but the, the key idea is we, 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 we minimize the amount we disturb the soil. So we don't do things like plowing. Um, we maximize diversity of crops. Diversity is good, heterogeneity is good, we know that. Um, we like to keep the soil covered and a, and a living root within it. So what you don't wanna do is plow and then leave bare soil over the winter with a, sm a small winter drilled crop in it. Um, you wanna use new technology, new tools um, to do that for you instead, cover crops, for example, over the winter. Um, and you also want to integrate livestock back into your farm. So a lot of farming in East Anglia has become arable only, cereal focused only. A lot of farming before, you know, uh, you know, 80, 200 years ago was more mixed that, you know, most farmers would have some livestock on the farm. And actually we're kind of going back to that now because they can play a really important role um, in, in improving soil health and, and, and actually allow us to not use chem as many chemicals in our operation. What I do want to focus though on is the benefits that we, we get from farming with these, with these principles. Um, and I think there are kind of, three or four major ones. Um, the first I think is soil carbon sequestration. So we farm this way, we're actually storing carbon in the soil uh, by building up organic matter. And that's hugely important because, you know, agriculture hasn't, emissions in agriculture haven't reduced for the last 10 years. Uh, and so if we can get this going across, this type of farming going across a lot of the UK, then actually we have the, we have the opportunity to turn all those places into, all the soil there into, into carbon sinks, which would be 
you know, I think really quite material to our, in our sector. We get better water retention and, and therefore less runoff. Uh, so less nutrients going to our water courses, which has obviously been a, a real hot topic of late. Um, and, you know, you're also keeping those nutrients in your soil. So that's, that's good too. Um, one of the ones I'm really keen on, which doesn't always get mentioned in these circles, is the greater farmland biodiversity. You know, those of you who watch Spring Watch will have seen lapwing nests, skylark nests, and one we didn't get on there, but um, stone curlew, you, you know, all those species bred, you know, within our farm this year. Uh, with the stone curlew weren't successful, but all, all those species were attempts to breed, you know, on, on, in our farm this year, not, not in nature reserves, but in the farm. So by building biodiversity in our soil, it, we can then improve the whole, the whole ecosystem, and that's really exciting. And another one which I've not put on this slide, but which I think is equally important as this approach takes up, is that we've actually found this way of farming to be more profitable than the way we were farming before because we've saved so much money on, on chemicals uh, in particular. We just, we just don't use as many and we don't need the machinery to apply those chemicals either. So actually this is, could be quite exciting. It feels to me like it could be a win-win for a lot of farmers. Do a lot more for the environment and also for your bottom line in a challenging time. This is what the farm is starting to look like. We, we, a variety of practices we, we're using to match those principles. So things like cover cropping, you, you, that, that's, that idea is really just to put in a, a series of grasses and legumes, clovers, vetches through the winter. So rather than leaving bare soil, if you go around Ken Hill, you won't see any brown fields, you'll see cover crops in instead. Um, they're binding the soil all winter and some of those plants are actually adding nitrogen back into the soil. So slightly better, more fertile soil come the spring when we then will drill in um, our cash crop like wheat or barley. Um, a, lot more, a lot more nectar availability across the farm because we're using much, much more pesticides. Um, we have great margins and headlands. Um, that's, that's really important to us for building that biodiversity. Um, and then exciting, exciting kind of quite technical things. Uh, there's more than, you know, intercropping, but many more things like pasture cropping, polycropping, um, is a really exciting ways of mostly about building diversity in your crops to, to, to build soil health uh, and then deliver the benefits that I mentioned earlier. And we're also trying to do a lot of, a lot of work um, bringing people onto the farm, members of the public to learn about how food is produced in the UK, but also other farmers um, so that we can, we can see if we can get this approach uh, you know, uh, adopted elsewhere. A few of the other projects that we're just working on at the moment. So we, we've involved in a, a national uh, scheme of curlew head starting run by Natural England. Um, that's really exciting. They take eggs from air bases where they the way they'd other be, otherwise be destroyed um, and incubate them um, and then bring them to sites like Hen Hill where they get head started, literally get a head start in life. Um, and um, it's been a really great project to participate in with lots of partners to try and conserve a bird where, where numbers have been in quite poor shape. Uh, I think it's the most threatened wading bird in the UK. Um, you know, beautiful, iconic bird. So that, that's been really, really exciting for us to be involved with. First release was this summer, um, but we're hoping to be involved uh, for many years to come uh, with, with, I think there were about 80 birds head started this summer. Um, and hopefully that number can go up and we can see a rebound in the, in the population here and hopefully maybe some curlews starting to breed at Ken Hill. Usually they're just here overwintering. Uh, another, another project we've been involved in is the reintroduction of large marsh grasshoppers, which uh, is, the re is the rarest and largest grasshopper species in the UK, probably destined to extinction without interventions like this. Um, it had been constrained to quite a small range um, and a great team at a company uh, or well, organization called Citizen Zoo have been working to conserve the species. They've been getting volunteer volunteer kind of keepers to keep hoppers uh, and grow populations at home and then actually bring those out to sites like ours and there are some other sites in Norfolk participating in this where they get released and hopefully build up viable local populations again. We've also had our first our first summer this year of having people to Ken Hill to come and have a look at what we do on guided tours um, which has been a, a really great success. Um, we've welcomed almost a thousand people now so um, that's been Lovely to meet so many people on the farm, show them around, discuss what we're doing. Um, and of course, you know, the money that comes from that has been great in supporting the work we do as well. So really part of the bigger picture. And of course, 
uh, autumn watch, which was last week, spring watch in the spring, winter watch is coming up in January. And then hopefully we'll be able to do that, that whole cycle again next year. Um, so if you want to see a bit more of Ken Hill, um, there'll hopefully be lots of opportunities to do, uh, you know, on, on, uh, on uh, terrestrial telly. Finally, I just say, I hope, it, hope it's clear, but we're very open with what we do. We try to share all of our learnings and failures and, and success stories. Engagement, as I said, is seriously important to what we do. So do, um, do come and follow up with us. We're all over the social media channels. We've got a newsletter, which you can sign up for through our website um, and generally try to be you know, engaging and available. So um, please don't let this be the end of the conversation. With that, I will finish and say thank you once again. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions that have come up in the Q&A uh, as best I can in the remaining time. That's great. Thank you so much, Dom. Um, yeah, really interesting and amazing to see what you've achieved in just two years time. Um, I like the idea of having cattle and pigs as your site managers. I think we can probably all learn something from that. Um, we've got loads of questions that have come through. Um, so we, we probably won't get a chance to go through all of them, but um, I'll try and make my way through them and, and put them to you as best as possible. Um, so I'll start with a nice, easy one, but um, it, a really useful one, I think, is um, how can you or how, how do you, what advice would you give to young people who wanted to get into conservation or to get into this sector? Um, I think the advice I give is um, I, I, I personally had no training in conservation or ecology um or in agriculture actually um, um but i'm of the firm belief that uh to address the issues i mentioned sort of up front there needs to be a, a large increase in the inter interdisciplinary skill sets in our sector and so i well, it's really a word of encouragement to get stuck in uh in whatever way you can and bring to the table with what what, what you have um, whether that's simply volunteering or kind of taking the leap as I did and going from a, you know, a, a regular job into something slightly crazy like this. Um, I think there's lots of opportunities and um, I think we need a great variety of skill sets. And it's a really, it's a really exciting time to be involved. I think the last 50 or 60 years have been about, um, you know, decline, um, sadly. Uh, and although there are, you know, a lot of negative headlines there today, I hope that the next 50 years, you know, the period of my kind of working lifetime, there's, we're, we're talking about restoration and, and, and more positive outcomes. Absolutely. Um, okay, and so we've got, uh, we've got quite a few questions that have come in about sort of your relationship with the local community. Um, so I suppose if I was gonna sort of condense that into, into sort of one question is, um, how do you work with the local community? Sort of what's your relationship with, with your fellow farmers, local landowners, um, and sort of what work do you do at Wild Ken Hill to sort of reach out beyond just um, the boundaries of your land? Yeah, I mean, as a hugely important part of what we do, like critical and probably what I spend about half, half my time doing, um, there's lots of different audiences. Um, and I think our, you know, with our, you know, our local residents in Heachman, Snettersham, um, we've worked quite hard to try and, um, you know, bring them on the journey and get them excited about what we're doing. Uh, we've had a few open days where we've been able to have people over uh, for free and, you know, meet all the team and, sh and show them. We've been to present uh, a few times uh, in, you know, village churches and so forth, um, because I, you know, I think that for this all to work, uh, what I, you know, what I would love is for every resident of Heachin and Snesham to be a real advocate for the project, to be helping us deliver those outcomes uh, and, you know, to really love the place and, and, and also, res you know, respect it. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, the work we do there. Um, there's lots of stuff I mentioned organisationally, but then I think to your, your point about other, other land managers and farmers, um, a huge motivation for us is to demonstrate that this stuff works and then see if others are interested in doing similar or different or, uh, or you know, other things like this. Um, and I say, as I would describe, you know, there's a large, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of farmers in the UK, a large spectrum of people. Um, and we get a good chunk of people 
who are very interested, very interested in what we're doing, or already doing something similar, keen to learn. Um, there's probably a middle chunk, I would say, is kind of curious. Um, you know, they're not quite sure about what we're doing. It is, you know, it is quite different and quite radical sometimes. Uh, it certainly can appear that way. Um, but they've come and they want to learn, and we, you know, it's really those conversations are, are really good too. Um, and then, of course, you know, no, no change, no projects, you know, ever in the history of mankind went without, uh, you know, people who didn't think it was the right thing. And you know, we have we have those as well, um, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but you know, the, that's a healthy debate when it's when the debate is held, you know, in, in appropriately. I think it's really healthy, and we, um, you know, we we relish that as well. Um, we've had people, you know, I've had farmers to farm and, you know, I've presented to them sort of some of the stuff we're doing standing in a field of ragwort, uh, which is, you know, the, the, the enemy of all farmers. Uh, and we've had some good, you know, conversations about what the value of ragwort is, uh, you know, how bad actually is it? And hopefully we've changed some opinions and perceptions along the way. Um, so it's, it's a mix, but it's, you know, that's, 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 that's the, that's what we've undertaken with this project. That's what we're, 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 we're keen. That's how we're keen to make a difference. Um, and so we've also had quite a few questions come in, which I'll try and again, <laughs> condense into one question, which is around um, sort of the su success of the project. So, so a few people have asked in terms of biodiversity, you know, have you got measures in terms of what's been achieved? Um, so I think someone specifically asked about the wading birds. So you said in 2021, you had um, a great number. Do you have previous figures to compare that to so, I, so that's kind of one part of the question and then the, the other is in terms of the actual um the yield of the farm how mm. is that how is that now working um in comparison to how it was before um and and sort of have the results of that area that you've um that yeah, that, yeah you've got it, <laughs> got it. so i think um so on the biodiversity side the the major surveys that we're running, uh, the really big ones, uh, are kind of at three to five year intervals. So in the, this is for the rewilding area in particular. So the major, the first time we'll repeat those surveys will be next year. Anecdotally, we've seen some really cool stuff in the meantime. So for example, we've gone from between one and four, uh, you know, singing male woodlark uh, to nine last summer in just, just two years within that rewilding area. You know, so um, and we've also seen it just to the eye. You can, you can go out and see there's just a huge increase in the abundance of invertebrates. Um, so that all that stuff will hopefully be captured in the rewilding area again next year and then um, in, in following years, too. On the marsh itself. Yeah. So that's that's something we collect annually. Um, I think the best the best way is to go back to the pre the, 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 the numbers pre increase in water levels. So the Avocet, I think, was something like seven pairs up to 67, uh, quite a fickle bird, I've said, there was a lot of bare soil that year. Um, so a lot of those probably were, had come from, you know, neighboring coastal sites where they'd been breeding before. And maybe that 67 will come down a, a bit in the, in the coming years as, as they return, but that's a huge ten, tenfold increase. Lapwing, I think was similar, was around, um, you know, I think on the marsh, in an average year, Maybe for the five years in the run up to, to raising the water level, we'd have five pairs of, of lapwing. Um, and that went up to 21 on the marsh and, and 30 across the whole state. So really, you know, really decent improvements. And we um, try and keep a handle on all of that data as, as best we can. And uh, one of the guys who joined the team last year to aid us with, with, with the change of practices um, is that's part of his role, is dedicated to doing that sort of stuff. On the farm side, um, Again, the huge amounts of data gets collected. We, the thing with farming data, because it's volatile, you need to take things with a slight pinch of salt because you can't really see trends until things have been going for th three, five years um, because you know the weather. So last year, for example, was a terrible farm year. And yields across the UK were down 30 or 40%. I think that notwithstanding, what we've observed is that our yields on the farm are roughly comparable to our neighbours. So although we have changed the way we farm quite a lot, we've used less chemicals, less fertilizer, um, actually it hasn't had a significant impact on our yields because our soil is actually better. It's, it's healthier, it's more fertile itself, there's more nutrients in it. Um, so the crops, are, we've been sort of nourishing and looking after them in other ways. Um, in terms of 
Uh, costs, though, you know, and, and fixed cost is something you can compare year after year. Um, we've seen quite dramatic decreases in those, um, very fast decreases, and therefore our overall profitability from the farm has actually gone up. Um, and we're getting to, a, you know, th that's a bit of a journey we're on, and we won't be finished for a, you know, we won't be where we want to be for another three, four, five years. But I think we're we're quite close to a point now where if you took that subsidy completely away, we'd be we'd be profitable come what may, no, you know, whatever the weather, we'd probably be all right. Um, and so we're kind of get, getting towards our goals on the on the commercial side as well. Okay. Interesting. And so um, this is actually one of my questions. So I'm sorry for <laughs> for for butting in and asking. But um, yeah, I know when you were presenting, you mentioned that Natural England had been really supportive. Mm. Um, I was just, you know, if you if you're kind of a, a smaller landowner or or kind of farming elsewhere in in the country, and you're interested in a project like this, do you think that that support would be available as well from Natural England, or do you think that they would kind of gave you more support possibly because of the location or you know anything that you were doing specifically yeah I think I mean so on the one hand I won't lie we you know we um are the size of the farm here and the uh, the amount of biodiversity in other you know places like the wash merits quite a lot of attention from natural England and so we've been really lucky in that regard um and you know uh, one of the things about natural England, and well I guess the other thing before I come to that is Rewild, rewilding and the, and the way we're doing it and uh, I suppose we're we're hoping that tourism and you know nature-based tourism will actually help to support that uh, in the long term and make that viable um, you know that's probably not an option available to every farmer you know we're on the Norfolk coast which we all know is is pretty popular come summer and so it does offer us as Ken Hill an opportunity to to make this work and that won't be the same for everyone and, and so I can never say it's a one-size-fits-all tool it's not um, it, it's It'd be inappropriate in many areas, commercially and 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 actually, you know, ecologically, um, as as I mentioned before. Um, but what I would say is that the regenerative farming is is something that could be applied in all farm settings, um, and you don't need natural England for that. The exciting thing I think is, um, you know, that we don't, we don't as, as you guys have said to me before, we don't want to get into politics. But I think uh, the you know nat natural England did have funding cuts for quite a, you know the last ten years basically uh and um they did have a huge funding increase last year so that you know admit i think they would admit that the support they can offer to land managers and farmers like us is not consistent across the country it can be patchy um but we hope that that funding increase which is around 50 percent um will actually help them to deliver uh you know build more partnerships with people like us to deliver the outcomes that that, that we all want to see from um from the way we manage land. Okay, brilliant. Um, and so in terms of the you, your involvement at Wild Ken Hill, is there anything that you sort of look back on and think, oh, that was a that was a bit of a mistake, or I would definitely not do that if I was to <laughs> go back in time? Um, yeah, it's always a difficult one. I, I mean, I think, you know, I'd be first to admit we we very early doors, we mismanaged some of our communications with our with um, around the fencing. So, you know, we had to, we took out a lot of internal fencing, but we also had to put up a, a perimeter fence. Um, and, you know, we, we tried quite hard to get the message out about that we were doing that. Uh, but at the time we just, we just weren't known about, we didn't have really any presence on social media and uh, the message we did distribute just didn't get widely, um, you know, widely heard. So, you know, there was some there was some confusion early on about why why a sudden offence had appeared. Uh, you know, was it to keep people out? And you know, that was never the case. It was to keep the stock in, uh, the like the natural grazing animals in. Um, and so there was a bit of there was a bit of tension around that. And hopefully we've kind of got through that and people kind of have gone begun to understand um, you know, why I've done that. Um, I think if anything, I, you know, I just sort of I, I hope the whole thing, you know we've been lucky it has gone quite well so far i hope we we continue to make like good progress and sometimes it feels a bit quite fast and sometimes a bit scary um but i think that's kind of the urgency that's necessary actually to deal with to deal with some of the um the issues that i described early on you know uh, it's just serious stuff you know and it's we've actually got a deadline so i think let's get let's kind of get on with it 
Brilliant. Right, I'm just going to have a look. I've, we've got lots and lots of questions coming in, so I'm just going to have a quick look at them, and then uh, we've probably got time for maybe uh, two or three more. Um, okay, so probably a quick question, um, which is coming from Anne, which says, what's the difference between organic farming and regenerative farming? Uh, really good question. Um, and if I wasn't a farmer, uh, I'd be confused also. So there's no, there's no shame in that. So organic, um, which you probably already do know about, uh, which because we're widely marketed now organic. Organic is sort of chemical free farming. So without any chemical pesticides or, or fertilizers. Um, now regenerative, although that, that's often a result of, of really good regenerative farming, actually doesn't prescribe that as a, as a, um, as a technique. So uh, organic is quite prescriptive, I suppose. Regenerative is about applying a set of principles. Um, um, so, you know, in a way, sometimes, you know, quite a lot of organic farming could be seen as a subset of regenerative farming um, because it's it, it actually embodying all of those principles. There are also some practices used in organic farming, um, in particular, the use of the, of the plow, um, because that, that's how organic farmers sometimes tend to deal with uh, problems with weeds as they, they plow them back into the soil. Um, you know, that wouldn't be consistent with regenerative. So there's, there's quite a lot of overlap, but not, but not total. Um, and I, you know, I think what the big difference, I suppose, is regenerative is, is it's quite undefined at the stage. It doesn't have any standards. Um, really, it has some principles that we talk about between ourselves as farmers and we try to adhere to. But it, there's no, you know, there's no rubber stamping exercise which goes on. It's, it's a young movement. It's quite a, a wide and diverse movement at this stage. Um, and so we'll kind of we'll see how that, that pans out over time. Yeah. And I guess that's interesting because in some ways you can you can sort of pave the way and set that agenda but it's also difficult when, yeah to, to define it at this stage um okay so a couple more questions so uh just a quick one um why is it called wild ken hill um so well a uh, good question well so we're the, we're we're formerly really the ken hill estate that's the that's the name of the of the farm um wild is what we're trying to do we're trying to have a we want to work with nature and be a wilder place so wild is and uh, 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 we've affixed that to the name, uh, prefixed it to the name. Um, but the, the the name Ken Hill, we're a little. To, to be honest, we're a little still a bit um, loose on where that's come from as well. Um, it's on all the maps. It's spelled C A E N Ken Hill. Um, and there is I've heard some talk about that word being used in, um, I think you know old British dialects uh, being associated with knowledge uh, and there's quite a lot of archaeological interest around like our Icenian Iron Age archaeological interest around so the Snesham Horde if you've ever heard of that in the British Museum was was discovered at Ken Hill um, and so maybe maybe that's where it's come from but we don't we're actually not entirely sure on the provenance of the of the Ken Hill itself there is a there is quite a I mean for Norfolk there is quite a chunky hill uh, in the center of uh, in the center of the rewilding area a wooded hill um, and that's the actual the place name itself. Uh, but but as to the provenance, I'm not I'm not actually 100 percent sure. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. I thought it might be that there was someone something to do with someone, someone called Ken. Ken. There's no one yeah. called Ken. Yeah. yeah. So it could have ended up being Gary Wildhill or something. But it's just yeah, <laughs> just no. how it panned out. All right. Okay. And last question uh, before we wrap up because it's uh, nearly eight o'clock. Is um what what next? What species are you thinking of introducing next? That's one of the questions. Well, I think on the you know on the you know, reintroductions, we, you know, that's not, that's kind of, we've done a couple and they're, you know, they're, 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 they're great. Um, we think, you know, we do them when we think that they have, you know, real conservation merit and, and are additive to the system that we're, we're building here, but we're not, we're not trying to just, we never want to reintroduce stuff for the sake of it. Um, so at the moment we haven't got anything uh, in the pipeline. We, you know, people probably aware we were, we gained a license to, run a sea eagle project here uh, which unfortunately we can't run ahead with next year um, but the great thing about that is we've we've established that that project can go ahead in east anglia we've established its feasibility and so i'd, ex I'd expect that to happen if not at ken hill then then somewhere else this year or ne next year or, or or quite soon um and we'll we'll see i think you know there are lots of people talking about you know reintroductions of apex predators 
Uh, that's not, you know, to be honest, that that's that's not something we're looking at. It's not something that most practical rewilders will be talking about. Things like wolves and bear and lynx. That's it's it's you know certainly right. You know today it's not a reality. It's not possible, uh, and it kind of in a way it distracts a little bit from the, the core message for us, which is about you know building um, you know using land management to deliver uh, public goods for you know people, wildlife, and climate. That's what we're all about. And if reintroductions fit into that, then great. But for the moment, we haven't got any in the in the pipeline, I suppose. That's wonderful. Um, and um, I think we're, yeah, we're just about time to wrap up. Um, I should say um, we've had a huge amount of um, questions that have come in for you, Dom. Um, and I'm sorry, everyone, that I haven't been able to, or we haven't been able to sort of get through them all. Um, but uh, shameless plug, Dom, you are with us again tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, I should say, at 2 o'clock. Yeah. Um, and you'll be joining us with Jake Fines and Professor Tom Williamson from UEA. So if you do want to hear more from Dom um, and um, hopefully a chance to um, ask him a question then, uh, then you can, you're can. you more than welcome to join us tomorrow. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, thank you so much, Dom. It was really, really fascinating to hear from you. Um, and thank you for giving up your Monday evening. Um, and thank you for everyone else who's attended. Um, we've got two weeks more of sessions, so feel Feel free to join us and um yeah thank you everyone and uh good evening thank you for me also thanks everyone bye bye <laughs>